tired of screwing up, tired of going down, tired of myself, tired of this town. Eminent Waste of Time, Episode 9. I'm Doug. And I'm Chad. And we are joined once again by the illustrious Rob Griffin from TGM Off-Road. Say hi to everybody, Rob. How's it going, everybody? <laughs> so this is our end of the season race palooza show stravaganza is what I'm going to dub this thing. It's kind of a long title, but it's going to be a longer show because... Quite literally, you all have asked for it. Yeah. Uh, we started this off with the idea of being a, kind of a half-hour podcast and just wanted to see how people reacted to it, weren't really sure. And amazingly enough, we've had several people suggest that the show needs to be an hour long. And I, I don't know if we're going to do that all the time. It just kind of depends on what material we have. But <laughs> you could have knocked me over with a feather when people were like, no, we want more of this. Yeah, I was I was figuring everyone's like, no, less, please. Like, <laughs> if you could do them like quarterly or even every six months. Or like, not at all. Yeah. Well, I figured they'd phase us out. And could you knock it down to like five minutes? <laughs> and can you put a commercial in there, too? <laughs> the less we have to hear of you, the better. So it is the end of the racing season. Um, of course, Eminent Performance, we started out racing, and now we're kind of transi transitioning into other things. But uh, I wanted to give you an update about how the racing season has ended, if you haven't already seen the carnage online. So <laughs> uh, the long story short is I put it into a tree and tore the rear wheel off. Well, yeah. not entirely. It's, yeah. It was hanging on by... <laughs> Pretty much. I thread when I was done with it. Yeah. The axle, it, uh, it, I don't know how it did it. I looked at it when I came home from work today just to get a little bit of an idea of, you know, what, what we're up for. Um, cause I'm going to fix it, of course. But, uh, it, it broke the outer shaft where it bolts through the hub. It snapped it. Like the only thing holding it is a little piece of the outer boot is holding it and that's it. So. That's where the skill comes in. Yeah, I, I'm impressed. So, <laughs> so the long story short, uh, we're just kind of diving right into this. But what happened was we had a a coworker at the track who really wanted to go on a side by side race, and Chad thought he was going to have an opportunity to go around the track in an X3. And so we talked about this last podcast that maybe we would uh, switch things up, and we did switch things up. I ended up driving. Chad didn't get his ride in the X3, unfortunately, so he's he's still looking for that to happen. I'm sad. Sad <laughs> single tear. <laughs> but I did end up taking the buggy around the track, and I had a few things working against me that, honestly, hindsight's always twenty twenty. but I haven't really driven this thing since you've done pretty much most of the mods to it including the quick the steering quickener being the the largest one i mean i drove it around your dad's backyard and was intentionally doing donuts because i could do them really easily right but that's not really race prep driving no and um it was slick in a spot and i clipped a tree because i really wasn't entirely sure where the front wheel was i if i'm remembering correctly and it's always tough because it happens so quick we got about a mile and a mile and change into the track, and there was a straightaway that had one little jog around a tree, and it was slick. And I really just wasn't prepared for how the machine was going to react. And I was trying to make sure I didn't hit said tree, but it was slick enough. I was really being conscious about not jerking the wheel because there's the steering quickener on it. Yeah. Well, evidently I was playing it a little too close to that tree and I clipped it, which then kicked the back end out. And at that point, the other tree that I hit was way too close to even have a prayer of recovering it. And I went, uh, I probably hit the tree at about a 30 degree angle into the rock slider, kind of came down the side, broke the, uh, what did we call it there? The knuckle and yeah. pulled the axle out and broke the rear bumper. And, yeah. And it, it, and, just, it went through it. The amazing <laughs> thing is, it didn't hurt the tire. It didn't hurt the wheel. I mean, and that's what really took the big hit of it. It hit those hard enough that it broke the knuckle on it, and like it just shattered the knuckle on the top and bottom mounts. Didn't even hurt the tire. So, and once again, the CF Moto A arms have proved to be the stuff of absolute legend. Oh, they are perfectly straight. <laughs> they are not even bent. 
which is wow. absolutely amazing considering the thrashing I gave that thing. Again, it wasn't intentional. I was moving at a pretty good clip because it was effectively a straightaway and I had to keep up with the pack. Um, but, uh, you know, it, it's it's tough to have a real takeaway, except for I've learned that Chad and I would set a machine up totally differently <laughs> for racing because I was basically racing it in the configuration he, you have it in. Right. And I would have it totally differently uh, it, it set up. I mean, I just... I'm not making excuses. I drove it. I hit stuff. I broke stuff. And I'll take full credit for that. Yeah. But that being said, if it was my machine, it would be quite a bit different. But it's just one of those things that it, it is all about driver preference and comfort because everything happens so fast. If you're not 100% confident with the way you're set up and you're not 100% comfortable in there, bad things happen in a hurry. And that's what happened in a hurry. <laughs> yeah. And I will say that that machine is not... I'm not saying it's set up bad, but even for me, it is not ideal for what I want. It's like when I sat in that XC3, a lot of you guys saw the pictures of that when we went up there to Ziegler. Um, man, just out of the factory, that thing is set up amazing. That is a driver's car right there. I think the biggest detriment, honestly, and the thing that bit us in the butt the most this season was the fact that the front wheels, you can't tell where they are. The driver's side wheel, you have a general sense of, but... It's fairly wide in the front, and it has a narrow nose. And so mentally, you have this sight picture in your head of these wheels hanging off into space, and you're not exactly sure where they are. No. And you get really nervous. Yeah. Like, you're really, really nervous about the right front wheel because you don't know exactly no. where it is. You cannot see it. And the nose is kind of a pinch nose where it's always pointing in like a V almost. Um, so you can't take, like, the hood line and say, well, it's this far out from it. No, it's that doesn't help you at, at all. At what point? No, I mean, it, it's just impossible. So, yes, that is a very hard thing. So, no excuses. I will take my lumps, and I will take all of the well-deserved criticism for making a mile into that lap before I totally trashed the thing. But it was just a weird confluence of circumstances, and honestly, I should have taken that thing out in the woods around here and thrashed it a little bit to get a sense of how it was going to react before I just dumped myself in a race. Yeah, well, so, that's how it is. I mean, you know. It's just a machine. It's a big toy. We're going to fix it. We're going to go back out there and we're going to have some more fun with it. So, absolutely. Is there, any more, is there any more races this year or was that it? I mean, I know that's it, but. Yeah, that's that's it for the series we're racing in. I, the, I, we are the last series. Yeah, to IXCR is already done. They were last week. GNCC finished two weeks ago. IXCR was last week. And we are MWXC is a series we ran and they finished just this last weekend. Um, Depending what races we pick and what series we run next year, uh, they start as early as the end of February. So we really, it's not all that much time off. I mean, it's about three months is about all we get. Yeah. Santa Claus come up with some parts. <laughs> <laughs> and some driving skill. Yeah. Please. <laughs> but, uh, yeah, so that's, you know, I, I hate to end the series on that note but that's that's how it ended up and it it's just how it is. you know <laughs> and it's funny it is a lot harder than most people think it is again i'm not making any excuses don't take it that way but it is a lot harder than most people think it is because it is very narrow even on the wide open parts unless you're in a field the the open parts in the wood are, are still not tight open. yeah and when you're going at speed 40 miles an hour through an area that may only be a couple inches wider than your machine it, it like i said it it's a game of inches, and when it gets slick and you're just, like I said, it's kind of weird when you have a steering quickener and you're thinking, I'm going to correct X amount, and the wheels are going way more than that. Yeah, it's 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 an interesting experience when you're not quite ready for it, and that really just came down to me being not quite ready for it. Rob just got up and left. <laughs> We've been ditched. We'll go on without him. It's okay. Um, no, it really is. And I, ha I had someone say on Facebook, uh, maybe I would be a better driver than Doug. And I, I instantly fired back, uh, you know, don't be so sure. <laughs> I mean, it, it, it's harder than you think. Yeah. Um, it's, it's Cause, fun, but. And Cause I, like I said, I've driven machines far harder, far faster in different situations and not had any problem whatsoever, but it just, 
what you got to be semi used to what you're getting. Everything I've driven has pretty much been stock. I've just jumped in it. But one of the interesting things was I realized I was way too far away from the steering wheel. You yeah. like to be a ways back. Yeah. I like to be like NASCAR, like, yeah. cause you're strapped in, you can't move. And that's what most people don't think about either who are listening probably to this podcast. You've got your lap belt on or you've got the, you know, the, the normal, uh, automotive style, you know, three point on. Yeah. You can move. This thing is like full on five point racing harness. When you're strapped in, you're not moving. And so you're sitting there perfectly still and you're trying to shuffle the wheel back and forth in your hands to to turn. And I would have preferred to bend like half again as close to the steering wheel, but I didn't really think about that until I got into the woods and I was like, Oh, this is not comfortable at all. Yeah. Well, and to to kind of add to that point, if you're looking at the video here and you're watching Doug and I I look like I'm a lot shorter than Doug. Uh, we're actually the same height. Torso-wise, I'm shorter, but I have longer legs. That's why I prefer to sit further back. So Yeah, I'm built like a jockey. I got a long torso and short legs. Yeah, and, I, <laughs> and I'm the opposite. I got short torso and long legs. So I like to sit back so that my knees have room in there. And the problem is when I do that, I mean, I can reach the wheel fine, and I prefer to sit back anyway, <coughs> but... Uh, like, I even have some trouble reaching all of the buttons, like, on the far side of the dash when I'm over there. Um, like, I have Doug kick on the uh, CVT blower. Um, because I can reach it from that side a lot I, easier. I can <laughs> reach it, but it's really hard for me to reach. Um, and it's just how the car's set up. If I'm going to build a purpose-built buggy, I'm going to design it for sure definitely different than a factory buggy, which may be the route we go if we're going to do this. Just keep the CF Moto up and just... I mean, we've already gone far enough. <laughs> Continue to go like whole hog race buggy. I mean, I, I don't need body work anymore. <laughs> Rob, what do you think? What's your seating position? Are you a steering wheel eater or are you back a ways? Man, I, I thought um, I was a steering wheel eater. And and that's the way I, after I changed out my first wheel, I went with a deep dish to get it closer to me because I thought that's what I wanted and felt. And then after running it through the woods two or three times, I, I, it didn't take me long to figure out I needed to scoot back from it a little bit. And so I'm, a, I'm actually on my third steering wheel and I'm the farthest away from it that I've ever been. So, and, and to me, it's a lot more, I'm, I'm not very tall. I'm kind of short and from the waist down, but I just, I'd rather have my legs stretched out and have some room to work the wheel than be right up on it. Yeah. I, I guess if you weren't, uh, and I'm sure you guys cut the wheel a heck of a lot faster and, and more frequently than we do just plow, playing in the woods, but uh, I, I can see the need to be away from it a little bit to have room to swing the wheel like that. Yeah. That's, uh, that's the steering quickener. Yes. Um, and Doug did comment that that steering quickener made it much harder to turn than he thought it would. Oh, that was, yeah, I'm glad you mentioned that. That's one of the things that surprised me. I told Chad, it's like, it's like driving a fully loaded cement truck. It's insane. <laughs> I have bigger arms than Doug. Um, just oh, here we go. No, no, no. I'm, I'm just naturally built. <laughs> Time bigger. for the gun show. No, I am not doing that. I'm just naturally built bigger. But like my whole family is built yeah. wide shouldered and pretty big. Um, so for me, like I could have driven it with the two to one. And that was like, OK, I was saying, OK, this is heavy steering. I mean, I, I told Doug I can get through a race with it. My arms are going to be jello. The one and a half. I was like, oh, this is cake. So, yeah, I mean, it it's different things for different people. Like you probably wouldn't do the steering quickener at all. I would assume if it was just yours. No, um, <laughs> me, I don't mind the one and a half to one that we have on it now, uh, because I don't really notice the weight. I just, yeah, it's again, it's just a preferential thing. But for me, it was, it was a weird, it was a weird sensation of quick, slow steering because it moved quick. The wheel moved quick when you moved it, but it felt heavy and slow. Like you, like I said, like you're driving a fully loaded cement truck. So my brain couldn't quite get around again without the experience behind it. My brain couldn't quite rectify this whole sensation of the steering's heavy, but the wheels are moving fast when that's happening. Yeah. And yeah, it just was, a. Uh, <laughs> it just, again, not something I'd have. I prefer on a machine like that, quick light steering even if i sacrifice a little quote unquote road feel doesn't bother me at all something like that yeah so again it's just all preferential and it would be kind of interesting down the road if we were both racing just like two literally totally different machines oh and, well yeah yeah it's <laughs> totally different so do you prefer heavy steering or light steering rob that one's to you light for sure 
Do you? Good man. Yeah. See, the, the only reason... <laughs> Why do you want to wrestle with it? <laughs> no, the, right. the reason I don't like a light steering is because when you hit a bump or something and you get hammered hard, like you jar real hard, you can move the wheel on accident. Whereas yeah. if it's heavy steering, it kind of deadens it or stabilizes it for you. Then in that True. case, you just don't have power steering then. You just go back to manual. <laughs> but I don't know if the steering quickener is the solution. Well, not for me anyways. Yeah. No, it, well, it, it's a solution because like we talked about and like Rob said, we are sawing at that wheel. I mean, going yeah, through yeah. the woods, you are back and forth. And we've said it before, but I mean, people think, oh, you, see, you save a second or whatever, a half second on every turn. But you multiply that times a couple hundred corners in a race, and all of a sudden you've shaved off 15 seconds or 30 seconds off your your race time. That's a big difference. I mean, And a lot of wear and tear on your arms, too. Oh, yeah. Like I said, it, it, I'm hoping that this whole segment gives people some insight into maybe how they want to set up their machine and kind of think of the pros and cons. And it really, there's no wrong way to do it. No. Well, I'll take that back. There are some machines out there that are just wrong. But oh, in yeah. general, there's, there's no wrong way to do it. And it really comes down to your comfort level and what makes you the most comfortable driver. You've got the money invested. You've got the time invested. And you're, in theory, trying to avoid large trees that rip wheels off. So you've got to be comfortable with where you are in the machine. and uh, Well, and also what the machine's built for. Yeah. I mean, yeah. I wouldn't put a steering quickener on a normal machine ever. I mean, I, I just wouldn't if it was me. Yeah. For a race machine, yes, I'll do that. Um, you know, th there's just it depends what the machine's built for. If I'm just trail riding, I don't need a lot of the things that I've done to the to the buggy that we race but it just depends what it's built for and you gotta yeah. i've always told people that who've come in either to the body shop and they want something or uh they've asked me to build them something i always say okay let's be real honest first what are you going to use this machine for i mean and if if you lie to me and you lie to yourself and you say i'm going to use this machine to race and you're really not and it's just like a one-time thing, you're going to regret the build. You're going yep. to hate yep. a lot of things about it. So the first thing you have to do is be real honest with yourself. And I think that goes for when you buy a new machine, too. If you go out there and, like, what you're really going to do is be, you know, a 55, 60-year-old person, and you're using it for yard work, and you go get the Razor 1000 Turbo with, like, no bed in it, or the YXZ where it doesn't even have, like, a backside to the bed, you're going to regret it. Does it yep. sound really fun? Oh, yeah. And it would be. But if that's its main purpose is yard work, you bought the wrong machine. Yeah. So, And, and most yeah. of the time you regret like far outlast the, you know, the, the fun factor and the payment's still around. And that's the problem. Oh, yeah. It's fun for like a month. And then it's like, I, this doesn't do what I need it to. And, and most people don't have the wherewithal that they're paying for these things cash. So now it's now it's you in the bank and the decision you kind of regret. And unfortunately, these machines are like a car you're going to lose 20% just by loading it on the trailer and taking it home. Yeah. So you better be really sure what you want. So, well, yeah. let's uh, let's move on to the real important couple things. Uh, first of all, Rob, I like your shirt. Thank you, sir. You that like is, that? That is a very snazzy <laughs> I shirt. I, I figured I owed you guys one. So. <laughs> yeah. He's, he's wearing one of our eminent performance. Uh, they're the Dickie brand. Uh, and it's got our shirts. it's got our old placeholder logo on it. So we're gonna have to get you an updated one now that we have a real logo. Yeah. All right. Right now it's my favorite shirt. So. Okay. Ooh, we need to make eminent waste of time shirts. Ooh, we do. And I don't know why that's never guess. occurred to me. We can give them out to guests who are on. So Rob would get one automatically. Look at that. I'll, I'll pay. I'll pay pal you as soon as the show's over. <laughs> <laughs> no, you're just getting one, buddy. Yeah. So, also, I see your uh, green machine back there has gotten bigger. It looks taller. I accidentally parked it in some fertilizer and it grew <laughs> up a little bit. Um, so we, I've we, heard we some people say your machine's full of crap. <laughs> <laughs> one of uh, one of our, um, well, you know Jared. Um, Jared came in uh, last week. He's actually in town working, and uh, he came in last weekend and spent the weekend with us, and we fed him way too much. And, uh, I saw the in, Facebook in, post in exchange, for, in exchange for a little bit of labor. So uh, <laughs> him and I, him and I put the portals on last weekend. I, they've been sitting in my garage for a little over a month and debating whether I wanted to put them on or not. And cause then it leads to tires and, and, and I, I didn't want to take away from what all the different things I like to do with the bike. So I was, I was actually sitting there just sitting on them debating if I really wanted to do it or not. And 
when Jared said he was coming down to spend the weekend, I was like, well, I guess it's on. Let's do it. <laughs> it's so. going down now. Yeah. So, <laughs> so I saw the video and I'll, I'll talk about the video first and then I'll ask you the question. I saw the okay. video. I don't know if you saw it, Doug, where he was lined up in his driveway and he bumps a throttle to let the shocks compress a little and then hits yep. it and pulls the front wheels, wheels. off the ground. <laughs> on a Viking. On a Viking. And this, this ain't no 1000 Turbo no. Or, or X3 or Maverick Turbo. I mean. Right. <laughs> so it's it looks very impressive. I mean, the size is awesome. I don't know how it handles yet. So that's part of the question. How do you like the handling? And Well, we do don't. You, I don't have a whole lot of ride time on it yet. Um, uh, we, Jared and I went out and terrorized the neighborhood a little bit in it. And um, we got... Uh, rode in some empty pastures and and went through some ditches and gullies and stuff and uh it's definitely um you can definitely feel the the weight of the portals in the steering wheel now um it it feels a little jarry the acceleration on it's incredible it's definitely um you can definitely feel the 30 percent gear reduction for sure i uh, wasn't able to really get it out and open her up and see how much top end i lost i mean according to their percentage i lost 30 percent of my top end but um i don't ever run with it you know, doing 60 anyway. So it doesn't, I don't think it's going to, I may regret it later, but as of right now, I don't. So, uh, well, I mean, for, it sounds like for the type of riding that you've told us that you do in the past, um, you, like you said, you aren't running top end, you're rock right. crawling and trail riding. So really it sounds like it's going to work well for what you're doing. Uh, I, I'm thinking so, uh, this weekend where our deer lease is up in Bend, Texas, and it's on the San Jacinto river. So, it's all rock, so I'll be able to go up there and play with it on the rocks and see how it does. And everybody was telling me bigger tires, put bigger tires on it, and and I think I'm gonna actually, as far as rock crawling and hill climbing goes, I think I'm gonna stay with the 30s on it. And it may look like it missed leg day a little bit, but uh, <laughs> in, in in my opinion, the, I mean that the whole reason we did it was for the gear reduction. Why take it away with a taller tire? So. I was going to ask if you were going to go, you know, a little bit bigger, maybe like, you know, 15 or 20% and keep some of your gear reduction, but uh, also have the bigger wheels or not. I was curious. So I guess you just answered that. And I'm with you. I don't care if it sits up high and has wheels that look a little undersized. If it does what I want it to do, that's all I really care about. Right. I may eventually step those up to a 32, uh, but I won't go any bigger than that. Not for a trail rock tire. I I think that's plenty big. Yeah. No, I I think. The mud tire is a different story, but. Yeah. So, well, that's, it looks good. I mean, I got to say, I, I don't mind it sitting up high and having a little bit smaller tire like that. I'm not the kind of person who really, at least on a side-by-side, I don't try and stuff the biggest tire it'll fit under it. Um, right. I generally stay around stock size so that I don't lose the performance because um, I'll let the skid plate beat off the rocks. I mean, I'm that's what they're there for. I build a heavy skid plate. I'm just going to let it slide across there. No, and I'm not yeah. the type of person who cares about, oh, you know, wide open, it'll go 80 miles an hour. I don't care. That's not what I bought it for, and I don't have any intention of running it that way that often. Like you said, it's about being able to get out of the gullies and climb the rocks and do that kind of thing, and yeah. whether you're right. set up to do that or not. Yeah. Well, and I think it all goes back to, once again, knowing what kind of riding and what the machine's going to be used for. I mean, that seems to be the theme so far. So if Rob was... Yep. You know, out there, we'll say you were in the dunes or something. Those those would be horrible for the dunes. You don't really Absolutely. need the ground clearance. You don't need the gear reduction. You need the wheel speed. Yeah. So that would yeah. be the wrong way to go. Um, and even if you were out in, like, open trails out in Utah and stuff like that, where they have some wide open long trails, that's probably the wrong way to go. Um, but for what you do, I I think it's the right call. I really do. Well, only time will tell, so we'll see. I mean... Uh, ultimately, ultimately, I'd like to turn that into nothing but a, a mud bike or a play bike, and and get a different machine for the tighter trails. And well, I don't know tighter, but An something X three, yes, yes. <laughs> so Chad can come yes. drive it. I'll get come off my visit back. you. <laughs> but to me, the X three is not a mud machine. I know the guys are doing it already, but to me, it's that's that's a waste of a purpose built machine, in my opinion. And yeah. I I couldn't so. agree more. It'd be like trying to take a Corvette out in the mud. It's just you know <laughs> you can. We've all seen those like yes. late late seventies Corvettes put on like C fifteen yeah, or C ten <laughs> frames. Is this is this leading into another chat story? No, 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 not this one. I have never done that. I have had a Corvette. It got shipped to Budapest, Hungary. Yeah, that's. Wow. <laughs> 
Well, you've already alluded to it. You might as well just do the story now. Oh, this this kind of dovetails into our stupid stuff with Chad. Yeah, uh, <laughs> we'll have a better one later, maybe. But so I I had a 27 Model T that I had cut and lengthened 14 inches and cut and widened eight inches. So I quartered the body and stretched it and widened it. It was full wow. custom. Um, I didn't, it wasn't like a full finished. It was really a rat rod. I mean, it was beer keg for a gas tank and it was just Chevy 350 with a four to eight inch rear end. It, it was a steering nothing. box from like a Vega on it or something. Yeah, it had a Vega box and the shifter was wrenches welded together in an S shape on the outside of it. <laughs> so, I mean, it, it was, it was a rat rod. I mean, I built it that way knowing it was that way, but a guy in Tennessee wanted that and he traded me a Corvette and gave me some money. It was a 77. Last of the flat windows. And man, the thing looks like it was painted in a sandstorm. <laughs> the first time I saw it, I'm like, did this get painted with a roller? <laughs> oh, it, it had so much sand and dirt in it. I'm like, I don't know how he did it. Like, but he did. <laughs> and it it wasn't a car I particularly wanted anyway. It was just one of like, okay, I'll I'll sell it. So I got contacted by a guy. I I just threw the Corvette up on eBay. I'm like, man, you know, we'll see what happens. Um and this was really before Craigslist was like a big thing. So there wasn't, eBay was your only outlet at that point. So I threw it up there and this guy contacts me and he's from Budapest, Hungary. And he says he wants to buy the car. And would I take a, uh, would I get, could I take a wire transfer into my bank? And I said, yeah, it's fine, but the car's not leaving until the money clears. And I said, I'm going to withdraw the money and make sure that the money is good and everything else. Um, so that there's no chance of you doing anything because, you know, I don't, I'm not shipping my car off. And he's like, that's fine. He said, once you're good with it, let me know that you have the money. I'll, uh, send my shippers are coming out of Chicago. And, uh, it, it was legit. I yeah. mean, as sketchy as it sounded, I was like, I'm willing to take a <laughs> risk on, you know, guy from Budapest who I don't know. And these two guys showed up and they said, no, this guy buys all kinds of cars like that because, uh, over there, they can find Ferraris and they can find Lotus and they can find all these, you know, cars that we don't have here. But over there, they can't find the old American muscle. So he buys up all these cars, puts them in shipping containers and ships them over there. And Doug's, wow. Doug's statement to me when uh, when I told him about this, he goes, you have to ask the guy if he can take a picture of it with a goat, goat. <laughs> next to it and a chicken on the hood when he unboxes it out of the crate. That's what I wanted to see. I never got that. It but. didn't happen, unfortunately. But I mean, yeah, this thing looked like it had been painted underneath a tree during fall, like actively shedding stuff. And oh, yeah. It didn't run particularly well. It ran super rich. I mean, I drove it up the street and back and thought I was going to pass out from the fumes. Oh, it was <laughs> bad. And the guy knew it. I mean, I told him, I said, it runs like crap. The paint looks like crap. Um, it's not a particularly nice yeah, car. Yeah, we, we did not misrepresent, misrepresent this car no. in any form or fashion. No, and I didn't sell it for, like, top dollar either. It was, like, I don't know, five grand or something. I mean, pretty cheap for a Corvette. So, and the sad right. thing is, I think the 77s from the factory had like 160 horse. I yeah. mean, they were, they were pooches, and, and that's I when they like ran right. I think like 100 right. of these have gotten out of the stable. <laughs> yeah. I mean, it was, it, it was... It had 60 donkey power left. <laughs> yeah, it was it was pretty pretty weak. So, yeah, that's, that's my Corvette story that I've had. <laughs> so back to your portals there. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I don't know how we got on that. <laughs> nice transition we, there. We did, we did warn everybody that this was going to be, you know, sidetracks from time to time, and that's part of the charm, or we'll call it charm. But uh, you're, you know, dovetailing into the last show, well, the, the show before last, we talked about the tie rods we were going to be che uh, checking out and yep. doing some testing on. So we sent you one. So you've got, uh, you got a tie rod on there from us, a heavy duty one. How's that working out with the portals? Because that's actually, I'm really excited you did that. So we have some data from something besides a stock machine. Right. Well, um, we, that was the other reason we were kind of debating on holding off on the portals because we wanted to test the tie rod first, see how it went and. I, it did get a few trips on it, but not not an excessive amount of miles or anything. And um, then after Chad and I talked a little bit, we thought, well, why not? And y'all already had a set on a Wolverine, so uh, we went ahead and did it. And and I was telling Chad earlier, you know, when Jared and I took it for a run, I put it in a few ditches pretty hard at at you know at a moderate amount of at a pretty decent speed. And I mean, it 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 shoved tire all up in the fender and came back out of it no problem. And so far, so far, they're doing absolutely great, and and, and there's got to be a lot of extra leverage. Those portals, if you don't know, they're they're they might be aluminum, but they're actually pretty 
pretty friggin' heavy. Yeah. So, um, so to me, there's a lot more leverage on that tie rod with the portal on it. It's no different than putting the big thirties on it, you know, and they just fold up a factory tie rod. So you're essentially taking a 30 and adding another one to it when you stick a portal on it, as far as the weight hanging off there off the end of that a arm goes it's a lot of weight it it was i was really amazed at how heavy they were when we pulled them out of the box yeah i i I immediately figured i probably needed to order some more ball joints but (laughs) (laughs) just just keep them in the back and a couple wrenches all right uh, Uh, yeah so far so good man i'm i'm really liking them like i said this weekend will be the a good test on them up in the in the rocks and i'll take lots of pictures but uh there's a lot of there's some uh some uh, rock quarries out there where they've done some mining and stuff where i can get off in them and play and climb on the rocks and uh get it down in the creek down in the river actually and and that's all rock down there so they'll get they'll get tested very well this weekend for sure good deal well to update you on the wolverine testing i guess because i haven't really talked to rob too much about this i mean we've all talked about the wolverine stock i mean and it's it's used to literally haul firewood every day because my dad heats his house and the shop with a uh, wood burning uh, outdoor stove. So it's used to haul wood every day. Um, so it's not like amazingly hard work, but it's what I would consider the more utility side of what these machines are made for. So we're kind of wanting, it, it really worked out really well because Rob's is a highly modified machine that is ridden hard and everything else. And the one we're testing on the Wolverine is more of a, it's a, it's your daily everyday use. The normal use is what I would call it more so than, you know, what like Rob's machine where it's a highly modified and everything else. Uh, and man, we've had no problems at all. I mean, I, I don't see how we could and we're, we're geared up. We're pretty well ready for production and, uh, we got, you know, they're going to be for those guys that don't know, we're, uh, I mean, I got a jig set up, and it's uh, it's a welding positioner, and it turns so that it will weld at the same speed all the time, so that they all look identical, um, and so that the welds are all perfect and the same. We got powder coater lined up. Uh, he's ready for us. He said whenever you get it, he can turn them around the same day if I need to. Yeah, so these are going to be a real nice uh, satin black powder coat. Yep. Yeah, we're yeah. we're not turning out any kind of part here that we wouldn't put on our own machine, and it's it's going to be first class all the way. And the the place we've got doing these is a race sponsor for the series we've been racing in, and we've seen examples of their work all year. And it, he he does good work, you yeah, know. He does. We wouldn't have uh, put this with somebody who we didn't trust, and you know we're not going to waste time getting these things built and then have them look like junk on the backside. Yeah. So. And like Rob and I were talking about, if if one of you guys needs a custom length tie rod for something, I mean, whatever whatever your reason being, if you're a you know a plus six or something like that, or you've had a long travel or something, we'll build them for that. And if you have a show bike you're building and you want a custom powder coat color, I mean, it's going to take some extra time for us and maybe a little bit of extra money because of the different colors of powder coat and stuff like that, and maybe a little bit of material cost. Um, we can build anything, so I mean, don't. Don't think, oh, you know, I don't really want black. I've like Rob, he's got green everywhere. So, you know, there may be, a, you know, you know, they're going to end up green sooner or later. <laughs> I know it. I know it. So, uh, no, but we can build any of it. So, you know, if you're thinking, you know, you got a yellow suspension bike or something and you want yellow tie rods, we'll, we'll set it up that way. That's not a problem. Just, you know, give us a shout on Facebook or, um, through our email addresses and everything else, our website, and we'll get you guys all set up. It, it'll just depend on how busy we are at the moment. We may say, yeah, we can do that, but it'll be a month before we get to it if we're super busy doing something else. But, you know, we'll uh, we'll definitely keep in touch, and we're not going to turn our noses up at, at something like that that's really going to make your machine stand out because we've got the capacity to do it. Yeah. Speaking yeah. of machines and portals and mud... We've got a question here from Robert Higby, and I'd like to have all of us weigh in on this one. He says, what's the best factory-built mud machine, the Polaris High Lifter or the Can-Am XMR? We'll have Rob go first on this. I'm going to say the High Lifter, for sure. Okay, Uh, reasoning. You need need a reason. You can't just... 55% gear reduction? Yeah. Yeah. If you're in the mud, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Um, I'm also going to say the Polaris because, and Rob, maybe you can correct me if I'm wrong, but I found no evidence against this. The XMR is still running the Visco lock, correct? 
four wheel drive? It, it's, from my understanding, yes, it is. I was actually having this conversation, a similar one about that very bike. Uh, one of my friends is thinking about buying one, and and that was the discussion we were talking about. And as far as he knew, it still has that lock. It's all, the only one that changed, I believe, is that uh, is that rock climbing edition. I forgot what they call it, the X three. Yeah. They changed. They put a. They changed the locker in it, but I know there's aftermarket. Yeah, the halo oh. lockers. The halo, yeah. Um, yeah, but the XMR still has a Visco lock. And for those guys that aren't Can-Am guys, and I'm not particularly either, but this is like my one hang-up with Can-Am, is uh, Visco lock is basically three-wheel drive. It'll turn the two yeah. rears and either the left or the right front. It doesn't do both. Um, and like Rob said, the gear reduction, uh, assuming you're doing mud, the gear reduction is what you want. If you're wanting an all-around bike, you may not necessarily want that much, uh, but the Visco lock is a big problem for me in the for a mud machine. Yeah. And I'm just going to agree with both of you because I haven't driven either of them, <laughs> and I'm not a mud guy, and your reasoning sounds flawless. See that, Rob? You say it with confidence. Yeah. People believe you know what you're talking about. <laughs> I can't believe he agreed with you, actually. So, <laughs> uh, Yeah, I was, I'm trying to first here on the podcast since we disagree about pretty much everything else. <laughs> you would think we hate each other, but we get along great. We just come at yeah, things man. from a lot of different, you know, different angle as often as not. But that's actually going to benefit us, I think, in the long run with what we want to do with eminent performance. Because we don't, don't get into fights about it. We just, well, I was thinking about it this way. Yeah. But uh, no, I agree with you. And really, it's 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 the the Visco lock that kind of sends me off about it, too. If I want it locked in four, I want it locked in four, not yeah. three or three and a half. Or <laughs> The reality is you could go with either machine and, and there are aftermarket kits to make them as good or better than the other. Um, but the, if the you're money just invested, buying it. Yeah, if we're just talking factory machine to factory yeah. machine. I'm gonna go with the high lifter. So yeah, I agree. His his question, if I remember right, stated a factory machine, purpose built for mud. Yep. Factory and built mud machine, exactly. So you buy it off the showroom floor and you go dunk it in the first mud, you know, bog you see. Yeah. Which one's gonna do better for you? Yeah. So. That's, That's sure. the first time you haven't been in the Can Am camp in a long time. I know it. <laughs> I know it. But hey, I'll admit when when some something isn't quite the way I would want it, I'm not gonna just blindly follow a brand. So. Well, also in the news, Textron. I don't know if you have you seen this yet, Rob. The Textron Havoc. I have, I have. That's an I interesting actually, looking machine. In fact, it kind of, especially because on the heels of again, not this podcast, but the one prior, um, it was Robert again, wasn't it? Asking about the what we thought about the four star general. Yeah. Yes. And so this machine is trying to edge into that territory. It is the high end utility, but also it's not afraid to run sport. Um, hold on here. I've got some. So I'll, I'll fill in some, some of the bits on it. So it's, uh, it's basically made to compete with the general. Like Doug said, it's a thousand CC. Uh, there, there hasn't been like an official statement, although we found some text, uh, text I've got a PDF from them that looks, <laughs> yeah, I, I know, but I mean, <laughs> it's not out. So it's going to be about a hundred horsepower, right? It, they're saying a hundred. I'm going to fact check you here. A hundred horsepower. There, there'll be no alternative facts here. <laughs> King 2.5 shocks. Yes. Um, it has a 24 cubic foot storage space behind the seating, but in front of the bed, it's kind of a dry Space. So it's it's an extended cab. So you know yeah. you've got your crew cab pickups and you got your standard cab and you got your extended. They have now done the extended cab, extended UTV. cab side by side. Yeah, yeah. Um, and it's a it's a dry storage too, isn't it or not? Yes, it is. It is a dry storage from what I remember yeah. seeing. And like the general, this comes with full doors. Yes, it does come full doors. Um, dump bed. Does the general have a dump bed, Rob? Do you know? I could not remember. I don't believe it does. I but didn't I, think it I did I wouldn't either. quote me on that, but I don't think it does. I didn't think it did. And you know, to, to me, I mean, you know, it, you may or may not need it. I'm just saying, if you're looking at a machine that's going to be a work machine in some capacity, I would rather have the ability to dump the bed if possible. So it does have that. Um, 28s on it from the factory. Yep. Um, the thing is rather chunky. It how many pounds? I'm wanting to say 1600 or something. 1755 dry, 1850 curb. 1850 wow. pounds. So fully fueled, oiled, and yeah, fueled. Fuel, fuel, exactly. Sitting on your curb, that's what it weighs. But again, this also 
it's coming from the factory with a 4,000 pound worn winch and some other goodies like that. So you start adding all the accessories in and you can see where the weight comes from, especially if they've tried to beef up the frame because it does have a 2,000 pound towing capacity. Yeah. Which for something with a CVT, that's pretty hefty. Yeah. Yeah, it is. Um, no, I I'm, really I'm like, liking what I see. I like the look of it. Now, I like the look of the general too. Uh, time will tell how how good it actually is. I mean, I have high hopes for it, but it, you know, it's also not out yet. It could it could be a colossal flop, and like marketing did excellent, and <laughs> production did horrible, and you know, whatever it is. So I, I think it's a good I think it's a good cross from. Um, people that are buying utility bikes like that and and uh, they end up being something way more than a utility bike i mean it, i think it's a good cross it, it has power it, it it's got good shocks it can you know and if the, the average guy wants to take it out go hunting and do work around his place he can and then yet at the same time he can go take it out next weekend and rip the woods up and, and have plenty of power and suspension travel to do it so i think it, i think there's a market for it I, I think the general falls in that same category as Something that you could, you know, work out of if you wanted to and, and that, turn around and rip it through the wood. That was one of the things that impressed me is the front and rear wheel travel are basically near as makes no difference, 13 inches. So there's there's some suspension movement there. What I'm curious, I want to get your guys' opinion on, on-demand all-wheel drive. A Polaris has that. I mean, how do you feel about it, though? Are you... I think for the majority of the world, on-demand four-wheel drive is great. Yep. I, I don't have a problem with it. Um, for if if I'm building a race machine, I don't want that. I want I want it either on or off. I want to know what it's going to do. I don't want it midway through a turn to all of a sudden engage and it's now handling different because it changes the handling right. characteristics. But that I know that that is ninety nine point nine percent of the world is not doing that with them, so they won't build them that way. Um, or does it have to? Does it have? Does it say if it has the capability to turn that off? It does not say that here. My gut feeling, based on what I'm seeing here, is no. It just is what yeah. it is. Hmm. Well, the Polaris one, you can turn it to just two wheel drive. So right. I, I would suspect that it would, but I have no basis for that whatsoever. Uh, I guess I misunderstood. I'm saying there's no way to like lock it in four. Oh, it's, okay. it's either yeah, two yeah, wheel yeah. drive or I don't know if you can turn it to two wheel drive. My suspicion is because they make a big deal out of it says, you know, fully or on demand all wheel drive is by default. It's two wheel drive. And then when wheel it needs slip, it, it kicks in. Yeah, just like your car. So I don't know that there's a way to defeat that necessarily. They're just intending on you getting in a mash in the throttle and going. Right. Um I, I agree with Rob. I think it's uh it's in the same vein as the general. I think it's a really good thing because the general's kind of been alone by itself for a couple of years in the market now. There needs to be competition in that class. And like you said, only time's going to tell. We haven't driven either of these. Nobody's driven this thing except for factory reps at this point. So I'd be interested to see. And I'd like to see them in person. Sometimes just sitting in a machine tells you all you need to know about it, even if you haven't driven it. If you X3. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you saw some pictures on Facebook, but you, I could not get over the look on Chad's face when he was in there. I'm generally a grumpy looking person. I know this. Okay. I've been told this by my wife. She always asks me why I'm frowning or why I'm scowling is what she says. I was smiling as soon as I sat in it, wasn't I? You looked at you looked like somebody who had just picked up like the world's cutest puppy and you just couldn't <laughs> take your eyes off of it. It was the funniest look on your face. Oh, I so want one. I I really do want one. Those X threes are amazing. Can yeah, what, am if you're you if you're listening you and you've got extra ones laying around that you don't know what to do with and want to sponsor a questionably produced podcast of two people who have had a <laughs> very mediocre racing season. <laughs> We're your men. We're, we're it. <laughs> and go. <laughs> have you got to sit in one yet, Rob? Yes, I have. And so, yeah, actually, we went this. Oh, I absolutely. I once. That's what I was saying. Is once you sit in, you're gonna be bit. It's. Oh it's yeah. A, it's an amazing feeling, and I have not got to drive one yet. But uh, yeah, we I went to um, when Jared and I were doing the portals. We boogered up a couple of uh, st wheel studs, and so we ran down to the local shop in town to grab some more and uh they just happened to have an x3 on their showroom floor so i said jared you gotta sit it and he's like no i don't I don't want to and he, as soon as he sat it man he was before 
I like turned around and walked over to the four seater. And before I got to the four seater, I got a notification on my phone. He had already, I took a picture of him while he was in it and I sent it to him. He had already upgraded his, updated his uh, profile picture on Facebook with him in the can. So. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah, you got the bug already. You've been bit. But it, it is amazing just sitting in it. It confirmed what Chad thought about it and that he really, really wants one. And on the flip side, you were sitting in that razor. Yeah. And you, oh, I hated that thing. I hated the new razor with a passion. The seats are they're terrible because they're supposed to be more comfortable. They're these flexible seats. So they got the it looks like really deep you know, seat bolstering that's gonna hold your sides and keep you in in place. No. But it flexes like crazy. Have and you, you sat sit in one of the oh, new razors, I, Rob? I was not a fan either. We I, actually agree I, on something else. Did you did you experience the same thing we're talking about here? Yeah, I mean, I didn't spend a, an, I wouldn't say I spent enough time in it to really judge the seat or nothing, but I mean, it was still a comfortable seat, but not, not like the X3 at all. No, um, I, I agree. The seat was comfortable, but it was not supportive. Like if you move side to side in it, the seat moved with you. Yeah. Uh, and it was not supportive. Which to each their own. I mean, some might consider that a feature, but not now, here. I, I will say getting in and out of the X3. If you're just using it like to run to, you know, run down the road or just drive across the yard, it is not an easy machine to get in and out of. Right. Um, it is not, I don't think, in my opinion, it is not meant for the, you know, I'm driving across the yard to get stuff. It's just not easy to get it's kinda in. Kind of like out. getting in and out of a Corvette kind of. <laughs> yeah. Oh, it is. It fully is. Yeah. Yeah. But they've designed it. So they, the whole idea is if you get in it, you're going to want to be in it for a while because you're oh. out running dunes or you're racing or you're doing something. Yeah. If you, again, we started off the show talking about this. If you buy it because you're going to do yard work, you're going to be bitterly disappointed. I agree. I fully yeah. agree. Although I think it would haul a bunch of wood very fast. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not the one you have to convince here. <laughs> I know. Uh, can I keep it at your house if I get one? <laughs> you might be keeping yourself at my house. I'm but, okay with that. I'll have you, an awesome machine. Your what's mine is yours, brother. You're always welcome. Yay! So we don't we we've saved the uh, the best for. I'm not going to say this is the last part of the show, but uh, before we completely run this out of time and do a three hour episode. The the ride Royal Blue trip. I almost screwed that up, and I had all the time in the world. <laughs> yes, you did. <laughs> it's a heavy burden being the mouth of this podcast, or whatever <laughs> I am. I'm not. I'm not going to say host. I like mouth. So, Rob, you guys went to ride Royal Blue. How many did you have show up first? Let's just start there. Um, I don't know. We had we ended up going a little. A lot of people wanted to get there earlier. Originally, we were going to show up Friday afternoon, and a lot of people wanted to get a little extra riding in. So we actually moved the day up, and we we actually got into um, Royal Blue um, Thursday afternoon, and we did a night ride Thursday night. So people trickled in as the weekend went went on, and I think Saturday we ended up with I don't even know the official count twenty three, twenty four bikes somewhere in there maybe. That's not horrible. Um, That's about where no, you wanted to keep uh, it. I think wasn't it? it was, it was really a good ride, and um, uh, Friday, Friday, um, they took us on some rides, and uh, it, I wouldn't say it was, well, it was, it was some pretty technical riding, um, not, not the worst I've ever been in, but it was definitely up there, and um, it was more than a few people had ever experienced before and weren't ready for, um, and a couple of people had kids with them, so it, there was some, there was some sketchy moments there. So uh, Saturday, we split the group up. And um, half the group went across to tack it to the really extreme technical riding, and then the other half um, rode the trails. Not that not that we um, babied them or through the woods, but um, it was definitely a nice. We did more of a scenic route um, with, with some slight technical stuff in there, but nothing too crazy. Um, but uh, yeah, it was it was definitely. It's if you've never been, it's worth the trip. It's a great park. Um, I was told that I could probably come six or seven times and never see the same trail. So. Well, that's impressive. The, the The house that we stayed in was new this year, and it was it was immaculate. It was beautiful. Everything there was great. They have a nice little convenience store there with all the all the stuff that you forgot to bring, and they got you covered. And it's always it's, how it it's is. A very, it's a very very nice place for sure. Well, that's that's uh, sounds like you guys had a good time, and I saw a bunch of the pictures. Um, 
and it looked like a good time. It, honestly, I'm still, I really would have liked to have gone. I mean, yeah. the schedule just wasn't going to allow it to happen, but it looked like an absolute blast down there. Yep, so, I agree. A little jealous. Um, <laughs> I, and I think you're always going to run into, you were talking about people kind of, you know, it was a little over their heads or over their skill of what they wanted to be in any way as far as the riding. Sure. I think you're always going to have that um, because people are used to riding their own little trails and whatever they are. And then they get out to some place that's big that actually has some big obstacles and they, it, it's just it's over their comfort level. What yeah. was, uh, were there any spots in particular that stood out in your memory? Like, man, this is, give us a sketchy story, I guess. <laughs> well, I know of one and it got a little beyond sketchy, didn't it? Um, well, I, uh, as far as rollovers go, <laughs> yeah, there was one of those. I saw a video. There was two, there was actually two, um, I guess it was, um, I don't know that anybody, I don't think anybody rolled, um, the last day there in Tackett, but two people rolled in town. Um, Scott rolled, uh, his Viking and, um, Keith rolled his, uh, and it wasn't a full roll. It was over on its side, you know, nothing, nothing bad. Nobody got hurt. Thankfully. And it was tired. Other, well, yes, it took an, it took a dirt nap. Yes, <laughs> <laughs> but uh, it was just some really off camber stuff, and you know as well as I do, the Viking suspension travel is not all there, and it just it just kind of they. I did not get to see Keith, so I only got to see t- uh, Scott's, but uh, it was just an off camber deal, and the suspension had no give to it, and it just laid the bike over on its side. And, but uh, there was some uh, there was one part I think um, one trail that we were on. I think we named it Tail Light Trail, and it was kind of a it was a very off camber climb and you had to straddle some rocks, uh, basically like on a 45, and I think three bikes in a row, mine included slid off that rock into another rock and ripped the taillights out of the, out of the driver's side. And it was, it was just crunch snap. And the next bike went through a crunch snap. And I was like, Oh, well, there goes my taillight. <laughs> yeah. I saw yours was missing one. And one of the pictures <laughs> yeah. you sent, Do you, yeah. I might have one sitting in my garage. Uh, I, I got one actually, okay. um, Scott, Scott, um, made an error on when he ordered he ended up with two of them somehow so he sent me his extra so okay i'm good to go again what a coincidence the cf moto is missing a taillight too yeah <laughs> <laughs> it's also missing more than that uh, yeah it was um the the uh one of the park owners um the lady and i i don't know if she's watching i'm sorry i forgot your name but um she was very nice she came down um i guess it was friday morning we had a little gathering down um kind of in the center of, of the place. And, uh, she came down there and, and I heard her asking, who's Rob Griffin? Who's Rob Griffin? I was like, Oh, what, what did somebody do? You know, <laughs> I immediately asking? thought I was in trouble. And, uh, she came over and she introduced herself and she was very thankful that we came and we chose her place to, to have our group get together. And, and, uh, she, she had already heard that we were wanting to come back already. So, uh, she was, she gave us, she offered us a discount, you know, next time when we come as a group and, and everybody will get a, a code on the next group ride. And, and I don't know what that percentage break is going to be. I think she says somewhere around 15%. So Hey, any, for, any free your, money is good enough. Absolutely. Absolutely. And the prices on their cabins and everything were very reasonable compared to what we'd stayed in in the past, but it was very nice, very well maintained park. Uh, definitely, definitely a place that you'll want to go to. Yeah. So I, I saw breakfast, uh, breakfast burritos i believe also we did we um saturday uh saturday morning before we all split up we did a little giveaway with some uh, prizes that um even some of our group members donated and uh and made themselves um we did a little giveaway and then we all had breakfast um we made uh just bacon egg and cheese tacos with every, for everybody and um it kind of between the giveaway and the tacos we kind of got a late start but but it was but it was worth it we just wanted to give something a little back to everybody and let everybody try a little bit of my famous hot sauce. So I've heard is amazing. It's it's really good. It's just a very basic recipe, but uh, I think I got it nailed down. Apparently, I got it nailed down where a lot of people like it. So I I think I think since the ride, I've sent it to I sent the recipe to about ten people already, and they're all posting on the Facebook. Check out the hot sauce. So everybody's making it. <laughs> yeah. See, we're just gonna have to come down and try it from you yourself. I mean, you know, the, the touch of the master's hand. Yeah. <laughs> I'll make some Jared's, chili because Doug. I think Jared Doug's snuck out here with a bottle or two this weekend too. I think so. Yeah, I made some extra anticipating that, but I'll make some chili. I'll bring it, or I'll make some when I'm down there. Doug's had my chili. It's not bad. It's solid. It is. Um, you make some hot sauce, and we'll just sit around and get fatter. 
and I'll make uh, <laughs> I make macaroni and cheese that'll stop your heart. So <laughs> yes, <laughs> chili uh, and ch- uh, chili and uh, macaroni and cheese and hot sauce. That's a heck of a combination. Hey. And well, we forgot beer. I mean, come yeah. on, Rob. <laughs> no, I don't. I don't drink beer, so I don't. <laughs> You're also going to like liars. I don't, liars I don't drink anonymous. it on days that end with Y. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So no, it sounds like it was a great. Uh, is the inaugural trip right? I mean, first. Uh, first yeah, get it was together. pretty much even the people that were having second thoughts about riding. Um, you know, after we split up and we took them on some more scenic trails and up in the, we went up in the hills kind of more and up in the trees. Um, at the end of the at the end of the ride, um, not I. I didn't hear of one person that doesn't want to come back and doesn't want it to be our annual trip. So I think it pretty much, I think it pretty much nailed down its spot and we're going back next year for sure. That's awesome. About the uh, same time of year. Um, we'd like to, I think, um, well, we've been talking and there's, um, some work conflicts with a bunch of people in, in October. So we may push it up towards the end of September, but that date's not confirmed yet, but, I'd like to see if I can work it in between a race season. Maybe y'all could make it, but yeah, no, uh, I, I think next year, um, and Doug and I have talked about this because of the man, just the properties that some of the races are held on. I don't know that we're going to run a set series the whole year. I'm not saying we're not racing, but we'll pick our races a little bit more and maybe, you know, hand pick a race or two from this series and a race or two from this series and then it, a, and we know. want to leave ourselves some time to do rides like Ride Royal Blue. We've even uh, been approached a couple of times about hosting a ride of our own, you know, on behalf of uh, CF Moto in one case. And yeah. so there's there's other things we'd like to do. Uh, and if we're eating up all of our free weekends racing, it just it makes that difficult. So we're probably still going to do some racing next year, but uh, eminent performance is obviously going in a different direction in a couple of areas above and beyond just racing. So we yeah. want to make sure we leave ourselves time to, to do some other things we know we're going to enjoy as well. So yeah. we're, I mean, we want to meet up with you guys and ride out there, you know, that's going to be a priority. Yeah. Yeah. That's happening. So yeah, yeah. you, you won't regret going there for sure. It's, uh, I'm glad we made the trip and it was a heck of a drive, but it, it, it was worth it. And we're not scared to drive that again. That, it was definitely worth a hundred percent worth the trip. And there's also talk of you guys possibly coming up here next year for uh GNCC Ironman in Indiana. Um, there is a guy with imminent performance that's been trying to persuade me into coming up there. Um, I, I don't know who it I thought be. I was going to get a little seat time in the CF moto, but I think, uh, his partner kind of blew that for me. So, nah, nah, you can still <laughs> drive it. I don't care. <laughs> I was going to say, it's pretty good on three wheels. <laughs> yeah, yeah, we're, um, we're sure. going to get her slapped uh, back together. By the time you're up here, you can put it in a tree yourself. <laughs> <laughs> I may end up turning the wrenches, huh? Yeah. Putting it back together. <laughs> <laughs> that, poor, that poor thing. If, <laughs> the other day, I had the thought that, you know, the Death Wish movies, Charles Bronson? Yeah. If you take all the Death Wish movies and put them back to back to back to back to back, that guy's had a really, really crappy life. Yeah. <laughs> the, the CF Moto is kind of the same thing. If you put the whole history of that machine back to back to back to back, oh, it's been, it's been, it's had a really several bad times. Life. Yeah. <laughs> but, uh, no, it's, it, I'll just keep putting it back together. It doesn't matter at this point. I'm getting really good at fixing it. <laughs> right. <laughs> the man is a wizard. So, uh, no, uh, we'd love to have you come up here and, I mean, I'd like to run in it, and I mean, even if we don't, though, just seeing the size and the scale of GNCC Ironman is just amazing. Yeah. Uh, right. And you're right. seeing, you know, even though it's not a points race, you're still seeing a lot of the top-tier talent there, so it's fun to watch. Yeah, it, it's fun. So, yeah, we'll have to try and get you up here for that, and it's the right time of year to be up here, and maybe we'll try and get down to see you guys when it's crappy and snowy up here it gives us a six month window yeah <laughs> it's nearly that bad now let's see that it's six months of bad weather where you just moved from down here we don't have that we got like three which is part of why i moved yeah so now uh well before we get out of here we've got one order of business to take care of which is stupid things with chad okay Uh-oh. <laughs> so doug, doug has a little list of these things that i've compiled so there's one here that piques my interest it says trucker pants on fire trucker pants on fire <laughs> <laughs> i just put little titles to all these so it remind me of the story so this is a short one too so it's good um I was traveling with a friend we were down for i believe it was biketoberfest down in daytona 
Um, and this has been, oh man, 10, 12, 13, 14 years ago, something like that. Quite a, quite You're a while old. ago. old. I know. <laughs> so, uh, I was with a friend and it was me and him and I think one other kid and, uh, maybe my family's home. You can see him walking in the background. <laughs> but, uh, so we're, we're on our way back from, uh, Biketoberfest and we, we have to get fuel in the truck and we're somewhere in like Tennessee or Kentucky. I don't right there on the border. And all of a sudden we're pulling in this truck stop and we're trying to fuel the truck and nothing's coming out. We're like, what the heck's going on here? So we walk inside and we ask the lady, is something wrong with the pump? She goes, Oh yeah, we had to shut the whole place down. We can't pump any fuel. We had to shut the electricity off this and that. I'm like, what happened? There's my son dancing in the background like a doofus. So, uh, the lady tells us that a trucker had come in to use the showers. And instead of what he thought he did was put out his cigarette, he just put a lit cigarette in his pocket and proceeded to catch the entire bathrooms on fire through his clothing. <laughs> <laughs> so the fire department's rolling up and everything nice. else. And they got to put the bathroom out like the fire out in the bathroom there at the truck stop because he put the lit cigarette in his pocket. Which is arguably like the hardest room to burn to the ground. Uh, yeah, and it, it's not like, <laughs> oh, you know, just his pants caught on fire. It it caught a lot of stuff on fire. Uh, it, it spread because apparently it got like the doors on fire and then the doors spread to the stalls and then the stalls spread to the ceiling and it was rough. So uh, we beautiful. didn't get fuel there that day and we had to move on and that's just how it was. So... <laughs> Well, hey, I want to say a big thank you once again to all of our sponsors. Of course, Watch Communications for giving us the space to host the webpage and this podcast for utv-doors.com for giving us the doors and the rock sliders that I destroyed and the rear bumper that I destroyed. And <laughs> it's not it's not a condemnation of his handiwork. It's, no, no, they, it, it, it did fact, well. They, they held up really, really well considering how hard I hit that tree. Yeah. Um, and, uh, we also want to say thank you to Colby valve stems again, smacked that tire into a tree. The valve stem held up just fine. Yep. Still going. And once again, Rob, thank you so much for being a part of our racing season for all the support you've given us. Uh, you were definitely invaluable and, uh, your financial contributions were much appreciated considering how much we had to spend to keep this stupid thing running this year. <laughs> Thanks to ourselves mostly. Yeah. Um, once again, you can find us on the web at www.eminentperformance.com. You can find us on Facebook slash Eminent Racing. You can find us on Instagram at Eminent Racing. And uh, there's some, well, if you go to one of those sites, you'll find the other places. Uh, we've got a YouTube channel as well and a few other things going. But uh, if you head to eminentperformance.com, you'll find more ways to contact us than you probably really want to. Thank you so much also for the feedback you guys have been leaving. It really does help us produce a better show. Uh, we're interested in what you think and what you want to hear about, so please keep the feedback coming. And if you have a chance and or the desire to leave a rating, I don't care if it's a one star or a five star, the, the feedback is what makes this work and it's going to help it continue to grow. Yep. Uh, and we got some more stuff coming up like we've talked about in the past. We're going to be at the PRI show here in just a couple weeks, two weeks or yeah. so. Yeah. Um, so that'll be exciting. We'll have a lot of stuff to bring you guys there. We'll probably try and do some Facebook live stuff from there and other, other little tidbits, pictures of, uh, some of the stuff coming out in the racing world. Um, so we'll find the stuff that won't get us sued if we release it. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right, everybody. Once again, it's been an absolute pleasure to be here with you. And we've actually ticked the hour mark. So we've gotten another listener request in there. Yay. And this may be more of a regular thing. It'll just depend on how much stuff we have. But uh, we now will not be afraid of surpassing the half hour mark and ticking people off. Yep. So, so, yeah, thanks again, Rob, for being on here with us. Thanks for having me, guys. Really hey, man. appreciate it. Always great to see you. Oh, it's always a pleasure to have you here. So No barking dog this time. No, <laughs> no just, just family. We're always going to have something going on. It's, yeah. it's always going to be that way. All right, everybody, we've got better. some more stuff in the hopper. We're going to look forward to seeing you here, like I said, probably once a week through the end of the year. And uh, so stay tuned. We'll be pumping out more content than you can stand. In the meantime, thanks for riding along with us. Thanks, guys. Thank you. I'm tired of going down, I'm tired of myself, I'm tired of this town.